Hey dolls, got some bad news to start with. Glitterberry's website is no longer active, but can still be accessed via the Wayback Machine. Considering that the last known online activity I know of is from back in 2017, I'm afraid she is likely no longer with us. If anyone knows any further information, please feel free to share it. But I want to make that known. It's not a great start to the video but I relied on her translation of the art book for these videos, and the loss of her contributions is a sad one. Bad transition aside, here it finally is, the second part of Colossal Misunderstandings that contains the core of what I believe needs to be discussed. Part of why this has taken so long is that I'm genuinely nervous because no matter how tactfully I put it, I'm poking the bear. Some of the things I'll be saying may seem harsh, and I'm not trying to be, and I don't want to take anyone's own personal attachment to the game away. I need to bring something to everyone's attention. Another reason why it took so long is because I wanted to see the response to part one, and I appreciate all the kind words everyone left behind. If you haven't already, please go ahead and watch part one, and might as well watch all of my other videos on Humito Oeda's games before continuing to watch this one. I'll be referring to them throughout. I did, however, get one comment that, despite largely disagreeing with them, I think it's my favorite because it's perfect for what I intended to talk about in part two. So here's a part of it. This is from She Who Shall Not Be Named. As much as it might be mean, I don't care that much what Ueda intended during development. Once you put a product out there, either your intentions come across or they don't, and that's something you have to deal with. The game truly belongs to its fans now, and Ueda's ability to craft a product that fosters the strong connection we see in this fan base is much more revolutionary than the Beauty and the Beast concept he had going. There's more to her comment I'll get to later, and I did reply to clarify that I was just merely speculating. Uh, he has admitted to not even playing his games, as well as being dissatisfied with them, and there are a multitude of possible reasons why. It could be like ideas he was unable to incorporate, you also have difficult development cycles like with The Last Guardian, I mean he had a bit of a breakdown, left Sony, and there was even a time where he was unsure if it was ever going to be finished. And as frustrating as that game is to play, it, you know, I'm glad it came out. But the response to The Last Guardian was subpar compared to his previous titles. I don't even know if what I just listed are reasons he's dissatisfied with his work, but this is an expression I've heard of film directors and writers, so it's by no means an unusual feeling for a person in his situation. The Beauty and the Beast concept is pretty much exclusive to what was going to be a second ending that the player would unlock by having an eco save file on their memory card. More on that later. Ueda does regret not giving Wanderer a happier ending, but honestly, I think the game is better off without it. I like what we have so much that anything different, I think, would take away something special. So I want to go into She Who Shall Not Be Named's comment some more. What she's somewhat touching upon is a literary analysis theory known as Death of the Author. There are plenty of great video essays talking more in depth on this theory, but to sum it up, it means that the writer's or artist's intentions with their work is not the only means to interpret it. For example, Hidetaka Miyazaki has mentioned that in Bloodborne, the imposter Iosefka, who has experimented on the real Iosefka and anyone else you send to her, is actually the real hero. As there is little evidence in the game to support this, and all of her actions seem to be just as wrong and abominable as the healing church is implied to be, I'm going to have to utilize Death of the Author when looking at Imposter Iosefka, unless he is willing to clarify some more. I do think that this is probably something that might have been cut from the game that we, um, as the player base, don't have the insight on. No pun in intended. <laughs> and I also can't quite agree with the notion that a game, or any work, truly belongs to its fans. Fan entitlement is a huge problem with online communities these days, and they can become incredibly toxic especially if shipping is involved. Fortunately, there isn't much room for ship wars in Ueda's works. And this isn't to say an audience isn't important, it's just you're the final part in the creation process. The author or designer or the development team, they're the ones who had the idea, the concept, and they took that 
and drew up storyboards, diagrams, crafted models for the characters, the weapons, the animals, placed textures to make surfaces feel real, fine-tuned animations, hired actors to bring life to words they want spoken by their characters, remove bugs and glitches, have a score composed, and there's just so much more that's involved in the creation. Games are unique compared to most other media in that the audience is an active participant with the work. This is the true role that the audience, or a player as it is in this case, has. I mean, is a book a book if it's not read? Is a game a game if it's not played? Well, if it's a published work, I'd argue no on that. However, just because an audience has interacted with a work and a fraction of that audience garners a fervor for it, doesn't make it solely theirs. Fans can and do have fun with works they love. I do support fan works like fan fiction, fan comics, fan art, you know, so on and so forth. A recent example is how fans reacted and loved the Lady Alcina Domitrescu and her daughters in Resident Evil Village. And I really enjoy the fan art that depicts them like a normal family rather than the bloodthirsty vamps they are. They've gained a life of their own through the fans' love. And this is fine because it's all in good fun. No one considers these interpretations as canon or how the characters are in the game. The problem with the Western Shadow of the Colossus fanbase is that they have, without realizing, made additions to the game that has rippled to a conspiracy. I mentioned at the beginning of part one that I decided to do these videos after watching deep dives on YouTube and a consistent trend I've been seeing throughout all of them. What I'm about to say is something fairly obvious, so obvious you forget about it. And yet whenever this is brought up, it generates an interesting reaction. The fan base that She Who Shall Not Be Name is talking about, the one that's dominated discourse on the game, is not the target demographic. A Japanese game is, after all, made by people with a Japanese cultural perspective, and media is largely made for a domestic audience. This isn't to say a foreign audience isn't important. The larger the audience, the better for these creators and publishing companies. However, it's important to remember in our analysis of foreign media that we are possibly missing elements of the work that is intrinsic to the culture it comes from. Shadow of the Colossus is no different. And I'm gonna be hammering this point throughout the video, so uh, be prepared for that. All right, let's tackle this beast. First phase, culture shock. So here's some background information on me. I majored in Japanese in college. I've also lived in Japan for three years, one year as a foreign exchange student to a Japanese university, and two more years as an English teacher. While I have some insight on a Japanese perspective, I am by no means an expert or raised in a Japanese cultural environment, and I'm not speaking for anyone other than myself and my experiences. Japanese media is popular throughout the globe, but it is made for their domestic audience as the primary market. Manga, anime, and video games will always carry a Japanese perspective, including works that have a more international audience in mind. Let's look at Lady Domitrescu again. While she is partly inspired by literary horror icon Dracula, she is also based off a Japanese creepypasta known as Hashakusama, which roughly means eight-foot-tall lady. She wears a white sundress, a hat with a brim not too dissimilar to Lady D's, and is, of course, very tall. Hashakusama has also appeared in another acclaimed horror franchise, Fatal Frame Maiden of Black Water, as a rare ghost encounter. You will not I don't want to take away anyone's enjoyment of and personal connection to Shadow of the Colossus. Some of what I will be saying is my personal opinion and some of it isn't. I try my best to be fair to other people's interpretations of this game as it is meant to have the gaps filled in by the player, but I do want to be honest with you and let you know I will default to my own interpretation. I think that when it comes to looking at foreign media, we do need to be aware of cultural aspects that are frequently lost in translation and are overlooked by a foreign audience. I actually have my scripts reviewed by friends who I know through my experiences in Japan. One of them mentioned how the title of the game may have contributed to players focusing on the Colossus more than on Wonder Story. Ego is the only title of Ueda's releases thus far that has the same name across countries. This is fairly common with international marketing as the company wants the game to sell to a foreign audience, and that may require a title to be changed. 
Shadow of the Colossus sounds like a better sell in an English-speaking market than Wonder and the Colossus. Another interesting thought of the title change is that Shadow of the Colossus may be a reference to Dormin as the shadows that burst forth from the Colossus and surround Wander in the Shrine of Worship are in fact parts of Dormin. One thing to note is that the Western fanbase has bestowed names upon the Colossus, which may have contributed them to forgetting that the core of the story is with Wander. The Japanese fanbase, as far as I was able to find, is unaware of these names, as they've always had access to the official art book that confirms that, outside of development purposes, they were never given names. I also want to quickly point out that the characters that compose the Japanese word for Colossus, Kyozo, consists of the characters for Gigantic and Statue. The Japanese word for the idols inside the Shrine of Worship is Guzo, which uses idol and statue. The connection between the Colossus we fight and the idols in the Shrine of Worship is shown to us in-game. Looking at the art book, I noticed that in the original language, the two share the character for statue, which I thought was interesting. There's even a line written, but unused in the final version, that confirms this. This line would have appeared when Dormin takes over Wander's body in the ending sequence. Thou severed our body into sixteen segments, and encased us in stone monuments for an eternity in order to seal our power away. Also, the lands in the game are referred to as Inishie no Chi in Japanese, which translates to the ancient lands. The sword Wander uses is also referred to as Inishie no Ken, or the ancient sword. So there's a connection between the sword and the setting the game takes place in with how they're named in the original script. Dormin recognizes the sword Wander carries, so it's a safe assumption that the ancient sword comes from these lands. In preparation for this second part, I watched Japanese streamers, Let's Players, and even tried to find Japanese blogs as I was curious to see what the domestic audience took away from the game, and it was rather interesting. I'll be honest, I really only watched them reacting to the ending as the game is so minimal on cutscenes and dialogue that the ending cinematic is typically where the best reactions from the player and their live chat come in. One of the things I touched upon in part one is that much of the discourse on Shadow of the Colossus emphasizes the Colossus much more than Wonder, the character who provides motivation, pathos, and who we control. I don't want to discuss more on this as the nature of the Colossus is up to player interpretation, but I just want to clarify a few things going forward. Also, as I've spoken of in previous videos, the way the Japanese language works is that they rarely ever use plurals. The Japanese script always uses the singular form in reference to the Colossus, and I want to keep that emphasis for my own personal preference. And while we're on the subject of the Japanese language, Dormin is not referred to in the original script with any pronouns. The English script does use the he pronoun, but Japanese is a language where pronouns are often unnecessary. I've mentioned that the usage of a masculine and feminine voice for Dormin is to communicate to us that they are a being above humanity to where our concepts of gender don't apply to them. This game came out in 2005, and the non-binary singular usage of they as a pronoun wasn't mainstream, and the dominant voice in this sequence is the masculine one, so the localization team went with the he pronoun in the English script. Watching Japanese players was rather interesting, as they often understood the connection between Dormin and the Colossus far better than Western players. They immediately notice during the sequence where we control the now dorming possessed wonder that we have become a colossus. And this may be because Japan, like many Eastern cultures, focus on the group over the individual. They introduce themselves by surname first, as opposed to first name first, because an individual says a lot about the family they come from. And I believe this cultural mindset allowed them to easily see the connection between Dormin and the Colossus. The Western fanbase has a more individualistic mindset, so many of them separate the Colossus from Dormin. This is in part how the names came about to be. With the design of Shadow of the Colossus, Ueda did not want the setting and atmosphere tied to a specific real-world culture, but he does employ some Japanese elements in his games. Most of you know of Haiku, a Japanese poem where each line goes by a 5-7-5 syllable structure. 
There is also Tonka poetry, which is similar to haiku, but employs a 57577 structure. Traditional Japanese poems are quite short, yet are written to evoke an emotion that lingers after it's read. You could say this isn't too different from English poetry, but I would argue that English poetry tends to emphasize more on the written or spoken word and convey metaphors and hidden meanings with them. Haiku and tanka are limited in how many words can be used, that their purpose is to evoke an emotional resonance with the reader. It's what is left unsaid that is at the heart of Japanese poetry. There's also a concept in Japan known as wabi-sabi. Wabi is recognizing the beauty and humble simplicity, whereas sabi is concerned with the passage of time, the way all things grow, age, and decay. Everything in the world is temporary. Cherry blossoms, for example, are the national flower of Japan, and they are only in bloom for a short period of time. Every spring, people gather to have picnics and appreciate the beauty of the flowers before they quickly wilt. And I absolutely loved riding my bike along the path underneath the cherry blossoms when I lived there. The Forbidden Lands are filled with complexes and structures that have been long abandoned. Outside of the few small shrines littering the lands, all of the architecture is designed as an arena to fight a colossus. That's their function in terms of game design, but Ueda also wanted the setting to encourage the player's imagination on what long-forgotten civilization of these lands and the purpose behind these areas. For example, the 11th Colossus is hidden in a temple that is reached through what appears to be the parched remnants of a lake. And because I watched a wet culture video while writing this essay, I'm going to mention the rings in the 13th Colossus's arena. Sometimes... Structures and buildings will wind up buried in the sands of time. And I believe the rings are placed there to suggest just that. Not any differently from the other Colossus arenas. Wabi sabi, y'all. So much of the setting is designed to have us wander through the remains of a once great civilization. It's solemn, quiet, and sparsely populated with wildlife. There is an aesthetic in Japan known as Ma, which is the appreciation of negative space. To quote Unique Japan's page on the subject, Ma speaks of silence as opposed to sound, of lack as opposed to excess. Kernachan did a wonderful video on the concept of Ma and how Ueda utilizes it. I'll leave the link to his video in the description for you to learn more. Ueda has stated that he purposefully removes details from the story of his games. The philosophy behind haiku and tanka poetry is partially employed in his narrative design. Other Elements is based off how he likes to watch foreign films, something I've described in previous videos. He prefers a film's original audio track without subtitles, which allows his imagination to fill in on the gaps of information he's depriving himself. The backstory behind what exactly happened with Dormin to render them in the state that Wander finds them in is unknown, with only the idea is that they did something that turned their worshippers against them. The art book provides a slight bit of information that Dormin is a being with knowledge beyond that of humans who did something forbidden. It's still incredibly vague, but given that the deal between Wander and Dormin is essentially reviving the dead, and that is informed to us as going against mortal law, it's a safe assumption that this is the forbidden act Dormin did. I recall from one of my teachers when discussing literature and film said that the Japanese are incredibly fond of endings that feel as though there's more story to tell. In other words, it's quite common for a Japanese story to have an open ending. Shadow of the Colossus ends in such a manner. I've seen it labeled incorrectly as a cliffhanger, but the story's complete. Wander defeats all 16 colossi, and Mono's soul is restored. All plot points are resolved. A cliffhanger is often used as a means of teasing the audience's desire for resolution by depriving them of it. Shadow of the Colossus doesn't do this. I like to think that most stories are granting us a moment of a character's life, typically of a struggle they have to overcome. At the end, everything should be resolved. But does a person's life end when a chapter in their life does? No. So why should a story end with such finality as well? There is mystery to this world, but unfortunately for some members of the audience, that isn't what concerns Wander, and is ultimately not important to the experience. Some of you may have noticed in the previous videos that I refer to Mono and Wander as lovers torn apart. While I strongly believe them to be lovers for reasons I'm about to get into, I do need to be fair and point out that it is never explicitly stated what their connection is. 
Other possible relationships between the two could be siblings, a knight and a princess, among others, and these could also overlap with each other. I'm going to always refer to them as lovers, so just be aware I am prioritizing my own judgment when referring to them as such. Now part of why I view them as this relationship is for a variety of reasons. First is the importance of Mono to Wander. The moment he places her on the altar, he recalls what Emon has always told him about this land, and that what he is about to engage with is strictly forbidden. The task Wander has to complete is one that we cannot definitively state he knew the laborious nature of, but he was prepared to also steal away the ancient sword. Dormin states that what he is doing goes against the laws of mortals, informing us that Wander is wishing for and engaging in a ritual that is detested by humanity. This is a forbidden task he is completely willing and prepared to do, knowing that he is betraying everything he was taught. The most important thing in this world for our hero is Mono. The loneliness we feel in this game is the loneliness I believe Wander feels in a world without her. For me, I cannot see someone do all of this for a sibling or a close friend. Some people have even theorized that Mono doesn't know Wander and he's loved her from afar, but I strongly disagree with this take. Here's their official bios from the art book. Wander, the young man with the ancient sword. The main character of this game. Wander has only one wish, to awaken the girl who has lost her soul. For that reason, he roams the ancient lands to challenge the Colossus. To revive the dead is forbidden. At what price will Wander burden himself? That will be clear at the end of the story. The maiden who has lost her soul. The girl quietly resting on the altar. A maiden with impressive long black hair. Her name is Mono. She has lost her soul because of a ritual. Her relationship to Wander is unknown. Why does Wander care not for his own self and devotes himself to the harsh struggle? Only she may know the answer. Agro is also shown to want Mono to wake up after defeating the fourth Colossus. Horses are skittish by nature, and Agro shares a close bond with her rider. She carries him to the Forbidden Lands and is keen defeating a few of the Colossus. Animal companions and stories represent the heart of their human counterpart. They are innocent, honest, and pure. Agro understands Wander's quest, and even sacrifices herself prior to the final Colossus. The art book mentions Agro survives via supernatural means, which we see when she returns once more to the Shrine of Worship after all of the Colossi have fallen, and Mono has arisen. Agro carried Wander on his journey, aided him in his quest, and in the end, is the only thing left of him to see his wish granted. Many players talk like Dormin tricked Wander, but that's far from the truth. I mean, they're certainly taking advantage of him. But Dormin does warn him that there will be a heavy price to restore Mono's soul, and Wander states... Hola, you do new. No cool now, the first time I played the game, the moment of Dormin's tendrils piercing Wander caught me off guard, and if Wander decided to stop here, I would understand him and those who argue that Dormin tricked him. But Wander gets up, defeats the second Colossus, the shadowy tendrils pierce him again, and then Wander proceeds to do this 14 more times. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me 16 times. I have a death wish and don't care what becomes of me. After the Eighth Colossus falls, the physical effects of this ritual start to become apparent. Now I'm of the mindset that Wander is aware of what has become of him, but he doesn't care. Even with Amon in his way, even when a guard tries to put him out of his misery, the only thing that matters to him is Mono. And before we take control of Dormin's new body, the last thing the camera focuses on is none other than Mono. I need to point out the entire reason why we are able to control Dormin at the end. It's because we are still playing as Wonder. This is stated from the art book. Even after your body turns into Dormin, half of you is still Wonder. His consciousness still remains. That's why you can control him. The reason he's so hard to control is because you're only one half. And when most of Dormin is dragged into the ceiling pool, 
where once again Wander, covered in shadows, doing his best to resist Emlyn's spell, but ultimately fails. The vision Wander has after the Eighth Colossus is essentially what happens. As Mono awakens in the vision, the camera is pulled away from her, just like Wander is in the end. Japanese fans also recognize the relationship between Wander and Mono is vague, but it's clearly that of a close one. The most common interpretation I see is that Mono is his beloved. Japanese people are fairly conservative in how they showcase their affections for a loved one. Americans are more physically affectionate with friends and lovers. One of the teachers I worked with talked about how we hug friends, which is not at all common in Japan. And I'm going to be using Americans as an example throughout because that's my nationality, it's just easier for me. One stereotype of foreigners I often heard living there is that we kiss each other all the time and it's no big deal. This idea mostly comes from watching movies and some TV shows, but I would always be like, that's not true, it's a big deal. But we need to understand that kissing is almost exclusive to romantic couples in Japan. In America, it's not unusual for family members to kiss each other, and close friends might as well, like on the cheek, not too dissimilar to the French, but that's more uncommon and something I've only seen in films. It's why I think Wander touching Mono's cheek is more a romantic gesture that conveys how he longs for her to wake up. He's now at the halfway point in his quest, so he's checking up on her, and I think in a way is telling her, I'm almost there. What may be a mild form of PDA to you carries significance in other cultures. Eco also contains parts of this, as Ueda stated in an interview. The concept of holding the girl's hand in Eco had, at its core, an element of eroticism to it, I thought. But that eroticism is mainly sublimated and never made explicit. When I read this quote, I considered that perhaps whenever we hold Yorda's hand in Eco, the heartbeat we feel could possibly be Eco's, as he's having his first interaction with a girl. And there are, however, um, certain implications with the ending of Shadow of the Colossus, and perhaps thinking of the characters as related might not be a favorable one. But the final reason why I interpret this game as a romance has to do with what I talked about in the previous video, the cut Beauty and the Beast ending. Beauty and the Beast is a romance, and Ueda mentioning he wanted to tell this type of story, I think conveys a lot of background information on at least his own interpretation of the characters. His upcoming game may feature more elements of the fairy tale based off the title of an image that he's teased, but when I read this in the art book, it was an epiphany moment for me. The most famous version of Beauty and the Beast is the original 1991 animated classic by Disney. It was the first film my parents took me to, and I do want to talk about it at some point in the future, but Disney's version is unique compared to the source material and many other adaptations. The Beast is actually the true protagonist of the film, and not Belle, but most people misinterpret that. Disney's version is about a man who has been cursed and has given up on his humanity. However, when Belle arrives, it lights a fire of hope in Beast that he begins to regain his humanity through his love for her. Mono is always referred to as having lost her soul and not dead, uh, but she is essentially dead that the only being that can restore her spirit is one who has control over the dead. Here's Dorming's bio from the art book. The Voice of Heaven possesses the art of manipulating the souls of the dead. A voice who gives wonder, who has visited the ancient shrine a divine revelation. A formless being known as Dormin. They tell Wander the girl will awaken when the tide colossus and idols within the shrine fall. They may also bestow advice during a battle with the colossus. Magic always comes with a price. The soul is often regarded as something unique to humans that one could say it's the source of our humanity. In order for Mono's soul to be restored, Wander has to give up his humanity. Only an act of true love can awaken the beauty from her death-like sleep. I honestly consider this game to be one of the most beautiful tragic romances amongst the medium, which is often void of romance outside of games with multiple options to choose from. While there are many of those that I like, I think they are ultimately less developed than if the writers just stuck with one couple. Uh, well, slow down, girl. It's just, it's just day one. Shadow of the Colossus is a true romance to me, and I'll be honest, 
I think it's a shame most don't want to view it that way. I do want to take this time to say you don't have to view the game the same way as me. I just want to make my case clear on why I consider them to be lovers, and I'm gonna always consider them to be lovers. One final Japanese element before I move on to what I really want to say is one that is also really obvious that it's easy to forget as an influence on the game. I realized this when I was looking at Japanese blogs, and one of them mentioned that fighting a colossus was the first time playing a game where you could fight kaiju as a human. Kaiju translates to strange creature in English, and doesn't necessarily refer to the size of the beast. While Godzilla is considered the first kaiju film, it's not the first film that could fall within the genre. King Kong is a few decades older than the King of All Monsters. It's kind of like the isekai genre. While the Japanese may have come up with a word that defines it, it's a concept that has existed across the globe for centuries. The kaiju nature to the Colossus is intentional, as the composer, Ko Otani, is famous in Japan for composing scores for Gamera and even later Godzilla films. So to any kaiju fans abroad and Japanese players, the game evokes these types of movies with not just the boss designs, but with the score as well. What she who shall not be named said about Ueda was doing something more revolutionary than a Beauty and the Beast story, I have to disagree. That isn't to say I don't think it isn't an influential game. Looking at the design aesthetics, it employs tropes that are intrinsic to traditional Japanese art and literature. I believe that many Western fans are unfamiliar with these elements being employed, especially in the newer medium of video games. Unfortunately, most of the anime, manga, and video games being made and released overseas are typically made for children or otaku who don't have the highest standards. Ego and Shadow the Colossus are considered the forerunners on the discussion on if video games can be considered art. It was during a time where the medium was entering its adolescent phase, and we began to see far more nuance and depth in video game narratives. The gameplay aspect of being able to fight large bosses without the use of a typical turn-based JRPG system, but up close and personal, is what I consider to be revolutionary. This game pushed the limits of the PlayStation 2 hardware, and that it could process all the detailed animations of the Colossus and Wander with minor hiccups was phenomenal at the time. There was nothing quite like it, and even games that heavily show their influence from Shadow of the Colossus don't carry the same gravitas. I'm thinking of the divine beast fights in Breath of the Wild. You're just hitting the weak points from afar. It's by no means bad gameplay, but it isn't figuring out how to reach and climb to their weak point, the intensity of hanging on as a Colossus pulls you underwater or flies upside down, or for me, <laughs> trying to get them to stand over that freaking geyser. And with this culture shock in mind, this leads us to... Second phase, cultural bias. Okay, I forgot to bring this up, but Shadow of the Colossus is a Japanese game, and it's made by people with a Japanese cultural perspective for an audience with the same cultural perspective. We, members of a foreign audience, are fortunate that Sony published the game globally, but that fact shouldn't be forgotten. I'm someone who hates beating around the bush, but I also don't want anyone to bother them. This part of the video is partially a response to Max Dirt's videos on the game. Now I want to preface, I have absolutely nothing against him, and he clearly works hard on his videos, but if you haven't checked out his channel, go ahead and do so. Um, I do think he makes a lot of videos that are worth watching, but... Uh, his videos on Shadow of the Colossus are, unknowingly by him, uh, engaging in cultural bias. He's not the only one I've seen say these things, and this is a problem that's not exclusive to Shadow of the Colossus. I do feel bad for slightly picking on him, uh, but it's really only just because 
his videos are the most numerous and thus they kind of are the inspiration behind this video. Now, I'm not going to break down his points and debunk them because, well, they largely hinge on one item from the game. And it's one item that isn't as important as you think it is. Just to break it down, cultural bias is where a person interprets and judges phenomena by standards inherent to one's own culture. It shouldn't be too difficult to see how that's a problem when looking at foreign media. As video games, anime, and manga have become more popular over the years, this is something I see all the time. We're all guilty of this at some point, as the culture we grew up in is so inherent in ourselves that we often don't realize when we're engaging in that bias. And it's not so black and white either. When a game is released outside of its country of origin, it does go through a transformation to appeal to a new audience. The people who localize the game work hard to maintain the author's true intentions, but there are some aspects that are going to be lost in translation or elements that could be considered problematic and need to be softened to avoid blowback from the new audience. And hopefully, we have people who don't accidentally mistranslate something significant. So where are Max and many others misguided? Well, it's been pointed out since the game was released that Dormin is Nimrod, an Abrahamic figure from the Old Testament, spelled backwards. And this is not a coincidence, as Sony did file a trademark for Nimrod Colossus back in 2004, one year prior to the game's release. But whenever the significance for this once was, is lost, as they wound up never using the trademark. I think I cleared up one of the biggest points of speculation among the fanbase, but don't get too excited. First, what does Dormin have in common with Nimrod? You've probably heard that Nimrod is the name of a biblical king who was responsible for the construction of the Tower of Babel. The tower was to reach high into the heavens in God's domain, but God didn't like this. Since this is after the Great Flood, God decides that he'll make it so that no one will be able to cooperate with each other and thus had everyone suddenly speak different languages that scattered across the world. This is essentially the myth to explain why we don't have a universal human language. Also, when Nimrod died, his body was cut into several pieces and then was scattered across his kingdom. But is this actually the story of Nimrod according to doctrine? I hope you're watching this video on a holy day, for we're about to do some religious studies. It begins with Noah, yes, that Noah, who had a son named Ham, who then had a son named Cush, who had Nimrod. In the King James edition, starting with Genesis chapter 10 verse 8, And Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Arek, and Akkad, and Kalma, and the land of Shinar. The land of Nimrod is also a synonym for what is better known as Mesopotamia in the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 6. Now, Babel is mentioned as the beginning of his kingdom, and there's a famous Bible story about that city, starting with Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language, and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Interestingly, the Bible never states Nimrod to be behind the Tower of Babel. The only thing mentioned of Nimrod is relatively positive. The way I've heard in so many Shadow of the Colossus videos seem to paint Nimrod as a villainous character, so where did that come from? It comes from later religious texts like the Talmud, among others. 
There's no historical record of there being a King Nimrod, so it's a character of myth. But some historians have speculated a couple of real-world figures he could be based off of, like Sargon of Akkad. The villainous interpretation of Nimrod is from the line, the mighty hunter before the Lord, to mean in opposition of, and that Nimrod sounds like the Hebrew word for rebel. Traditionally, Nimrod is associated with the practice of idolatry and would try to stop the birth of Abraham as he would end the worship of idols. I guess they placed him as responsible for the Tower of Babel as the Old Testament says his kingdom began with that city. However, there are also interpretations where Nimrod opposed the construction of the Tower of Babel as well. One interesting take I found was from a Hungarian legend where Nimrod is described as a giant. I couldn't find a source for Nimrod's body being cut into many pieces and scattered, except a quick Google search saying his uncle did that. Regardless, like many mythological figures, there are different interpretations that exist. While Nimrod is widely considered villainous, it honestly comes down to who you ask. Outside of reading the actual Bible and only really the significant parts, I did just a Wikipedia Google search because the truth is that this is an Easter egg. Some Western fans believe that there's a secret something to the game and seem to take it that Dormin's name is a clue to whatever Ueda is hiding. However, because it's a Japanese game made by people with a Japanese perspective for a Japanese audience, it's strange to make it so subtle considering that Christianity doesn't have any roots in Japan's culture. It's spelled backwards, so it's an indirect reference that if the target player base gets, great. And if they don't, well, it's not important to enjoy the game. The average Japanese person doesn't know a lot about Christianity. From my experience, they know Adam and Eve, the figure of Jesus Christ, angels and demons, Easter's about rabbits and eggs, and Christmas is Santa Claus. Whenever I had class that fell on Friday the 13th, I would mention that in my culture, we believe your chances of having bad luck are higher than normal and ask them why they thought that was. They thought it had something to do with Jason. I, I get why they think that, but no. If a Japanese author or artist wants to feature significance of a foreign religion in their work, they're going to be extremely explicit because their domestic audience will not pick up on it otherwise. And even then, it's typically utilized in a shallow manner, pure aesthetics. One frequently misunderstood example is Neon Genesis Evangelion. While the anime uses a lot of Christian symbolism, it unfortunately doesn't have any deeper meaning, as the director admitted they did this because they thought it looked cool and it would stand out from other mecha anime. Now, there are some exceptions that use religious symbolism with purpose, like one of my other favorite video games, Catherine. No, really, I love this game. But you may notice that Jesus and God are rarely ever mentioned. Japanese creators employ Christianity in a similar way to how American creators will use Greek or Norse mythology. It's coming from someone who is completely divorced from the belief. This isn't to say there aren't Christians in Japan, they are just an extremely small portion of the population that it isn't a big enough market over there. The religions that are rooted in Japanese culture is Shinto, a native religion, and Buddhism, which was brought over from China hundreds of years ago. Despite that they engage in customs and rituals rooted in these religions, most Japanese people would be considered agnostic. Let's Ask Shogo has done a video on this that I'll place a link in the description for you to learn more. Many people have also compared the Shrine of Worship to the Tower of Babel, and outside of both being tall structures, that's where the similarity ends. I want to highlight the functions of a shrine in Japan is where a god or kami rest, and people can go to give them offerings, of money typically, and pray for passing their entrance exam, good health, and so on. The shrine of worship is pretty self-explanatory. It houses what remains of Dormin presently, but the environmental design suggests it was once a place of worship with the idol statues and even an altar for sacrificial offerings. The narrative doesn't treat the Shrine of Worship as taboo, but rather what is housed within it, Dormin, 
and the blessings they can bestow. Dormin is a divine being, described as a voice of heaven in the art book. Nimrod was a mortal, who some interpretations have him overstep into God's domain or remain faithful to God. Dormin can be considered an evil god or a justifiably angry one who was wrongfully mutilated. They weren't evil until people decided they were. And for player interpretations, it depends on who you ask. The only true commonality I believe there is, is that their bodies are separated into many fragments that are then scattered across the land. And that's not at all mentioned in the Bible and seems to be an obscure part of Nimrod's story based off my brief research. Uh, the original title for this phase was Ethnocentric Apophenia. Apophenia is a phenomenon where your brain makes a connection between two meaningless points of data. Now, I changed it to cultural bias because I think that's a much better term for what I am criticizing, um, as apophenia does have some insinuations of paranoia, which is not really the case with Shadow of the Colossus theories, but I think what we are seeing is a lot of people just grabbing onto Dormin as Nimrod and really going with it and making up connections. And it's very easy to trick ourselves with this. Our brains have evolved to recognize patterns for survival and social interactions, but oftentimes it'll make connections that don't mean anything. And the connection made from the same two meaningless points of data could be interpreted differently. The moon's a great example. I'm an American and we believe to see a man in the moon. However, in Japan, they see a rabbit, despite that it's the exact same moon. There's nothing in the game or interviews to suggest this, but for me personally, I honestly think Dormin has more in common with the Egyptian god Osiris than Nimrod. He was the god of the afterlife, the dead, resurrection, and life. He's typically depicted wearing an Atef crown, which sorta looks like it has horn ornamentation. Osiris was killed by his brother Set, who then cut up his body into several pieces. Isis, Osiris' wife, managed to find all the pieces, but had to wrap Osiris up to keep him together, and could be considered the first mummy. He's often depicted as having green skin as a result from being resurrected, and his lower half is bound. Dormin has a greenish hue to them, and there's an old model where Dormin's lower half trails off into a point, resembling bound legs, maybe. Of course, this could be coincidence but it's an awful lot of points the two share. And that's how apophenia can work. So while Dormin being Nimrod backwards is intentional, there is a trend among Ueda's naming conventions that's also at work and we shouldn't ignore. Ueda is very fond of giving names to his characters with double meanings. All of his games under Sony have, or at one point had, a name that was a Japanese counting pun. Trico has multiple meanings behind why he chose that name, and I'll let him share what they are. え、え、鳥、鳥の子供として鳥子とか。あとはまあ、あの、ダジャレなんですけど、ま、以降、ワンダが2個ってプロジェクトネームだったんで、ま、3、3つ目っていうことで、えっと、3っていう意味のあるその捉
I've also seen people talk about how alchemy is involved in Shadow of the Colossus, based off one line during Emlyn's narration at the beginning of the game. Apparently, the word ends has some significance to alchemy, but the reality is that this is a localization flourish, as the original Japanese script uses the characters for existence and nothingness. The usage of ends is to give the narration an archaic feel as though the story of the Forbidden Lands has been passed down for the ages. The alchemy that most people refer to is the European version or the Western version, and much like with Christianity, if that's going to be intentional on the behalf of the Japanese creators, it will be explicitly referenced. The type of alchemy most Japanese people would be familiar with is the one that came from China, which was almost exclusively used in the making of medicine, or as how it's often portrayed in Japanese fiction, potions. So I would be cautious about applying European alchemy as an interpretation on Japanese games if it isn't outright mentioned or foreign influences are apparent. Again, anything that would be influenced by a foreign culture that isn't common knowledge in Japan would be explicitly clear in their media because they want the audience to understand it. Some of you may think Ueda is different and wouldn't use such imagery and symbolism so superficially, but he would and has. In The Last Guardian, you come across several stained glass eyes that prevent Triko from looking away and moving forward. These eyes are based off an actual amulet known as the Eye of Nazar that are charms to prevent a curse of the evil eye. They act as a neutralizing agent from anyone who is sending you bad vibes with a look. In The Last Guardian, the Trico's eyes are capable of mesmerizing people, so they are easier to consume. Remember what one of the meanings of Trico's name is? The Trico are capable of hypnotizing people, and so the stained glass eyes turn their mesmerizing gaze back onto them. And you know, this isn't uncommon for creators to pull inspiration from the real world and change it a bit for artistic license. Now, does this mean I think a player having a Christian interpretation of Shadow of the Colossus is an invalid take? No, I don't actually. I understand where some are coming from as I see it too. The moment where Mono picks up the now infant wonder can be viewed as a type of virgin birth, which is often associated with Christ. What I was able to find among the Japanese fanbase is that a few do know of the connection between Dormin and Nimrod, but the most common one I came across was looking at Wander and Mono in the end as Adam and Eve, not a virgin birth. Again, those implications I mentioned earlier. However, the way I've always seen this referred to by Ueda is as Wander was being purified of the essence of Dormin that was inside him with him being so corrupted that he had to essentially be reborn in order to be cleansed. And while one might consider this a baptism, water being used for purification rites isn't uniquely Christian. While the spell can purify Dormin, it cannot erase the taboo Wander broke, thus the horns remain. Emon is sympathetic towards Wander and hopes he is able to atone for his sins, but if we truly take the connection with Ego deeper, it appears that this atonement won't be for possibly several hundred generations. I'll talk more about this in phase four, but it's time for... Third phase. Video games are just that. I think that I'm really poking the bear here. I'll start with this question and answer from an interview with Kanan Rince. Your games always stand out to me as being very philosophically driven. Are there any specific works of literature or thinkers that you can name as some of your primary inspirations? For example, I feel like Shadow of the Colossus is deeply influenced by Taoist values about respecting the beauty and inherent balance of nature, as well as serving as a cautionary tale of the dangers of man overstepping his boundaries. My interpretation of The Last Guardian, on the other hand, is very much centered around Aristotle's views on friendship. Are these the kind of themes you considered during the writing process? This is my personal opinion but I don't really get conceptions based on expression media like films and novels upon making a video game. Even if I had some kind of themed or philosophical images in mind, I wouldn't cling on to them and rather value the consistency and harmonies that are inevitably generated through the game design process itself. This is because I feel that clinging onto a theme is far too inefficient when making a video game. 
If video game production was to be compared to writing, my thoughts is that it's closer to looking for words to fit in the squares of a crossword puzzle, rather than crafting sentences with whatever words you like onto a fresh sheet of manuscript paper. Hence, it's still far from reaching the degree of freedom of expression that novels and films have creation wide. In this respect, I think I'm the type of creator with a designer's perspective rather than that of an author. This phase is to talk about an aspect of video game analysis that's not exclusive to Shadow of the Colossus discourse. I'm mentioning it here because I see it everywhere and figured it's crucial to talk about. Video games are not real. And aspects of a video game is oftentimes because it's a video game. I'll be somewhat touching upon, but not focusing on what is known as ludonarrative dissonance, which is otherwise when the narrative of a game and the mechanics of that game clash. For example, in Breath of the Wild, Calamity Ganon is breaking free of Zelda's seal and we need to defeat him before he regains his full power. Uh, you, but you can take as long as you want. Uh, Calamity Ganon's just gonna always be swirling around Hyrule Castle until you, the player, decide to fight him. He's not going anywhere. Sometimes the developers will incorporate game mechanics into the narrative design. I recently was replaying Control, and there are checkpoints known as control points that serve the gameplay function using your ability points to strengthen skills, modifying the service weapon, and most importantly, fast travel. The writers also incorporated Jesse Faden being able to travel from control point to control point into the narrative, as though it's just another para-utilitarian ability that's unique to her. They didn't have to do this, I would have been completely fine if the story never addressed it, but you know, it's rather nice that they did. Little narrative dissonance is going to be inevitable in many video games. The player will always have to suspend their disbelief in order to enjoy the game. I just need to accept that Wonder can survive falls like this, even though I know in reality that wouldn't be possible. This part is purely my opinion, but I find discussions on this aspect of video games to be largely counterproductive. It's an important aspect of game design, no doubt, but there are times where it just really comes across as nitpicky. I watched a video that overanalyzed the bonus weapons and gear you can unlock in Shadow of the Colossus. And I don't think he's the type of designer who would place important lore to optional bonus content. Everything in a film or video game is based on the decisions of the people who make it, and we need to step back and just accept that. The decisions behind those reasons can be either meaningful to the experience, a natural part of the medium in the case of gameplay mechanics, or just because they can. The instances I've seen this come up in Shadow of the Colossus discourses... Frustrating. I'm often frustrated, not gonna lie. I was watching one iceberg video that talked about how in the demo for the game there were walls blocking off paths that would later be accessible in the final version. Instead of acknowledging that the developers blocked off part of the map to keep certain sections hidden until the full game is released, they chose to talk about it as if Dormin created this wall and that there must be a mysterious reason for doing so. Whether or not the developers decide to write into the game's narrative the mechanics of their game is up to them. I personally think it can be rather clever with what they come up with, like the control example. My point is that video games are unique as there are elements made for interactivity purposes over the narrative, world building, and design aesthetic. We also need to bear in mind the type of designer Ueda is. In the Kane and Rinse quote I pulled, he refers to himself as a designer and not a writer. This is largely why there isn't much dialogue in his games. Not only does he dislike NPCs that repeat the same dialogue over and over, but he also doesn't think writing is his strong suit. Often what happens for his games is that he works backwards. Instead of the writing informing the design, the design informs the writing. This is a man who graduated from art school with a focus on abstract art, and he likes to watch foreign films without subtitles. Uleta starts his game design process with a simple idea. Iko was a small boy holding an older girl's hand, Shadow of the Colossus was climbing and defeating giant monsters to save a maiden, and the last guardian was a child with a giant animal companion. The real reason that it's always daytime in the Forbidden Lands was due to the hardware limitations of the PlayStation 2. They actually designed a day-night cycle and weather system. 
but had to scale it back to where it's only being used during the fight with the final Colossus. With this in mind, Ueda decided to incorporate it into the story by saying that as long as Dormin was weakened or sealed, time was frozen in the Forbidden Lands. As someone who has worked on productions, it may surprise some of you that the creative process isn't as streamlined as you think. No one designs a game by a strict adherence to a grand blueprint. Scenarios are added, removed, altered, and so on throughout the process. Oftentimes, elements wind up in the final product just because they can. The watermelon ending upon a second playthrough in Eco is one good example. One of the animators just decided to create a watermelon eating animation because they had time, and Ueda liked it that he put it in the game. It wasn't storyboarded at that point, nor was it planned, it just, well, it was cute, so why not? To bring it back to She Who Shall Not Be Named's comment, and if you're watching this, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not picking on you, I just really, I do really love your comment. There was something that she mentioned that I also disagree with, and that is she considered the final playable section of the game, where Wander is being pulled into the ceiling spell as a moment of player's choice. The player can either resist or accept their fate, and while this is technically true for the mechanics, in terms of the narrative, for Wander to not put up any resistance is out of character. The reason why you're seeing him in this footage, um, where he's just rolling backwards to the pool, is because it's me recording it, and I've played this game so many times I know it's pointless, but most players try to fight and hang on to whatever they can in their first playthrough. I know I did, and that's the case with many people who stream or record their first playthrough, uh, but I cannot definitively state that for everyone. This is a man who was willing to do the impossible and forbidden to bring Mono back. For him to not even bother fighting at the end isn't true to his character. I've seen people incorrectly refer to Wander as a silent protagonist, as if he's a blank slate for the player, but I believe it's the opposite. I consider Wander a character of his own, separate from the player. I am not playing as myself in this game. I am playing as Wander, who has his own motives and wants that are completely separate from me. While he is in a place that is full of mystery to him and us, it's not where he is that is important, it's why he's there. I think Ueda wanted us to feel, for a moment, a sense of false hope at the end, only for us to realize the futility of it all. I think we're supposed to feel what Wander feels, and not for him to be a projection of us. Looking back on part one, I saw some people placed too much weight on what I clearly stated to be speculation on my part on why Ueda is dissatisfied with this game. He has admitted he is with all of his games, but I was projecting my own biases on him. I even admit I'm not perfect either. I don't want to repeat myself too much, but the purpose of part one was to share my own interpretation of the game, and I wanted to highlight the Beauty in the Beast concept he wanted to work on as a means of looking at the characters in a manner I don't see too often. It's funny that everyone agrees that the game is purposely vague and minimal for the player to have their own personal interpretation, but everyone seems to default to the same one, and it's one I've never completely agreed with. I love romance, and... I'm going to be talking about a couple of romance stuff on this channel, so if that's not your thing, um, well, that's a shame. But I was attached to the tragic romance of this game, and, well, I do think it isn't appreciated as much as it should be. Of course, one can look at the Colossus and whether or not there are moral implications on defeating them. Reminder, they were designed so that their nature is ambiguous, thus any morality imposed upon fighting them is up to the player. Considering that there is a time attack mode, um, I think Ueda wants them to die. Well, for those who are part of the Secret Seekers, they were incredibly misguided. The details that the poster who originated the secret hunt mentioned everything that Ueda is known for, environment and animation details. For whatever reason, they seem to believe that this attention to detail must mean there was a secret left to be uncovered and... From what I could tell, many believed it had big implications on the game. They became so desperate to find the answer to a mystery that never was, they even began to hack the game. 
I mean, we really need to consider the type of developer Ueda is. He removed an entire ending solely as the unlock requirements would alienate players who hadn't played Eco. He also mentions he wants people who don't regularly play games to play his games as well. He's not the type of developer who would hide an obscure something that would be the key to it all, knowing that many players wouldn't find it. There's a time attack mode, and his other titles also feature trophies for beating the game within a specific amount of time. What might be really into speedrunning? There were some cool things players found. My personal fave is this unused dam model that, well, I believe was likely an alternate design for the 12th Colossus Arena. Part of the reason why Ueda doesn't really talk much about the design process behind his games is because, well, to him, this is his job, and it's really not as exciting as a lot of people may think it is. Actually, uh, games development in progress is much more boring than many people think. It's just a bunch of people with headphones working extremely focused uh, and a million meetings. So that's really what it's like. It sounds like the same situation. And while, you know, this stuff may be mundane in nature, it's still fascinating for a lot of people. Uh, there are people who are very much interested in how um, the design process works for their favorite games. And I appreciate YouTubers like Zully the Witch and Lance McDonald who reveal aspects of game design many players don't know about and some hidden details we would otherwise never see. But unless elements of it exist in the regular version of the final game, we shouldn't place a lot of weight on cut content. I know I've talked about the cut Beauty and the Beast ending too many times, I think, um, but I wanted to clarify why I think that does still have significance, and I mentioned all this in the first phase. I mean, but this wasn't really quite the case with the fan base for Shadow of the Colossus. I mean, people were treating a bugged model in a demo as having some significance to the lore. It's just a bugged model. <laughs> they didn't expect you to find it. I think what I found so frustrating was that after watching some of these videos, it came across to me that the actual game we were given wasn't enough for some players. I spoke earlier on the Japanese elements do create that silent, minimalist resonance that's prevalent in their culture. Perhaps what was left to linger with them was misunderstood by the Western fanbase. But to be fair, one shouldn't really expect them to know certain aesthetics of a completely different culture from theirs to enjoy game experience. At some point, it seemed to me they became so obsessed with finding what was never there a mystery they invented themselves, instead of appreciating the beautiful melancholy and tragedy of Wander's own story. Another possible contributing factor to this is the discussion of games at the time. The landscape of games was very different back in 2005. I mean, the medium itself was still very niche and was considered either childish or an activity the losers of society engaged in. Video games weren't even protected underneath the First Amendment in the United States. The PlayStation 2 era was when that began to change, as gaming became more popular as a hobby, and the games themselves were, well, they were rivaling film. Both Eco and Shadow of the Colossus were at the forefront of our video games art discussion. Ueda, being a graduate from an art school, is well aware of the connotations of the discussion on what is considered art, and it appears as though the fan base attached those connotations onto his work, but didn't completely understand Ueda's approach to game design and how his Japanese background plays a role in it. It's art, so there must be something more to the game, right? And if you're wondering if the Japanese fan base tried to uncover any secrets, well, the only thing I was able to find was mention of players trying to find an alternate ending, but gave up when it became clear the game only had one. We are given everything that we need to enjoy the experience. The mysteries that you want to solve aren't really mysteries. They're not important to the overall experience. It doesn't matter the what and why of Dormin being in the state they are in of Mono's sacrifice, of what happens next, or in between the ending here and the beginning of Eco. <sighs> I don't really know how to wrap this up. I acknowledge that I'm being quite harsh, 
and possibly mean sounding but I'm not trying to be I'm not trying to take something from you I'm just wanting to add something more to the discussion but most important of all is this final phase the most important secret is you okay cheesy titles aside this is the truth of it all Ueda designs his games with story elements removed and structures in the midst of decay as he wants the player to have their imagination run wild. Even when it comes to explaining certain aspects of the stories and worlds of his games, he emphasizes that they are his opinion, like with the Kane and Rince example. He'll be honest in interviews on how he approaches game design and even his own personal takes on endings like with Eco. But he wants you to focus more on your own interpretation. And Ueda's respect for player interpretations is why I don't think looking at the game as containing some Christian philosophy is invalid, at least to an extent. I personally see a parallel with Greek mythology, especially as many of the development names for the Colossus are based in Greek myth. The Forbidden Lands could be viewed as the underworld, much like Hades, which is not just the name of the god, but also the name of the underworld, which was an actual place on Earth. It's why many heroes wind up visiting it. The story of Shadow of the Colossus is similar to that of Orpheus and Eurydice. One could say Mono's cursed fate wasn't too dissimilar to many Greek prophecies, in which trying to prevent it coming true happens to set up the exact circumstances that see the prophecy realized. I really want to convey the artistry for this game, and I really just want to open up people's minds to other ways of looking at it, because that's how Ueda wanted this game to be played. But at the same time, we do need to remember it is a Japanese game, and well, sometimes our bias may play more of a role in how we view the work. And that isn't necessarily wrong, we just need to be more mindful of it. Even if some of our interpretations may not be what Ueda expected or intended, I don't think he would oppose them either. Final thoughts. So this is just where my final thoughts are, parts where I couldn't find a place. I try my best to use language that conveys what is my opinion, but regardless, it doesn't always come across that way to some people. Part of why I've never agreed with the largely accepted take on the Colossus is because I couldn't get over that Dorming was torn apart and we're just supposed to accept it as just. I don't consider the Colossus as alive because the source of that life was never truly theirs. It was stolen, and it's unnatural. Whether or not the essence of Dorming is what makes them alive, or is more of just a magical source, like how I view it, well, it's up to you. I, you know, you have your take, I have mine. That's all I want to say on that. I did come across one take that said this game has no faith in humanity, as all we do is overstep nature. I strongly disagree. Taking the Colossus aside, one could say just restoring Mono's soul is overstepping nature. But in a world with magic and a divine being that can control the dead, I mean, what exactly is natural? Regardless, I know Ueda didn't intend such a bleak look of humanity in this game. The final moments are bittersweet. It may not have been the reunion Wander and the player wanted, but they're together. And the Forbidden Lands isn't a lifeless place as we thought for most of the game. Ueda even created this artwork of a now toddler wander with Mono and Agro watching over him. The two are happy and everything is just going to be fine for them. This will be the last time I talk about Ueda's works for a while. He is working on his next game and when more comes out about that, I'll make another video. I probably won't be doing a video essay of this caliber for a long time. This was a lot of work. I may do a live stream or Discord follow-up in a few days. I'll make a post letting you know when if you're interested in that. Um, I received a lot of comments where people want to like really look at the magic and elements throughout all of Ueda's works. And I want to highlight that when we refer to Eco, Shadow of the Colossus, and The Last Guardian as a trilogy, we really mean an artistic trilogy, not one where they are consecutive stories within the same world. While Eco and Shadow of the Colossus are connected in the same narrative world, I think they're mostly separate stories. And The Last Guardian, for me, I lean more towards it taking place in its own world. If you disagree with that, 
cool. I mean, honestly, it's of no consequence either way. It doesn't really matter all that much in the bigger picture. And I know there's a lot of people who want to focus on like the magical aspects in all three of those games. And I really think you're focusing on the wrong details there. I don't think there's much thought going into them, but that's my personal opinion. Well, I appreciate you watching and for keeping an open mind through this long video. And I, I lazed about a little bit, so I apologize for that. If you've never do edited a hour long video before, then you have no right to judge me. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much. You've been a doll. <laughs>